All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I know we had good uh, competition right now in this parallel session. So I hope you'll have fun. <laughs> and let's talk today about feedback, Jira, and quality. And overall, I would like to share with you what we did over the last year on this topic. So my name is Lena Zubite. I am a QA lead at DHS2, and you have quite a lot of DHS2 colleagues here, actually, if you're not from DHS2 in this room, so you can meet them. Uh, I'd like to give a brief agenda on what we're going to be talking about. So first of all, I have a little introduction. Then I'm going to share the cleanup mission that we did uh, for our bugs, especially. Then the triaging process improvements and how we're actually doing triaging when it comes to bugs. Bug bashes and bugathons, because we had a few of those. What are they overall and what we learned from there? The meetings we did about quality process, as well as our some kind of mission that we had. And overall, I have some insider tips on how you can help us improve quality. And if you find a bug, how do you get it fixed? Because I guess that's in everyone's interest and the ones that are tuning in as well. So first of all, my name is Luna. Since I was little, I had an inclination for bugs. So as you can see here, it's, it's a picture of me when I was two years old and I am holding a ladybug, which is already half broken because the front wheels are not working anymore. Uh, so I think I liked bugs since I was little. I am Lithuanian. I have lived in Sweden, Hungary and Germany. Um, ten, more than 10 years in software with focus on quality. I have a side project and a podcast and a blog called Quality Bits because of my surname, Zubite, which was never cool, by the way, until I moved abroad. And then some people were like, oh, I tried to buy this domain of your surname because it has a good sound to it and it has a bite. But my blog is actually with bits. Uh, I'm a QA lead here at DHS2 since last summer, so it will be a year in July. I really love books, mountains, and dancing, and I'm leaving tomorrow morning, so I really hope we go to some dancing place tonight. <laughs> Hopefully we can do it. I'm a bit awkward at small talk, and I like more like deep philosophical questions. So if you want to discuss something like that, let me know. And an example of a question would be, what breaks your heart? This question is not a romantical kind of sense of question. It's a question, what do you care about so much that you're like, ah, oh, this really is important to me. And for me, very frequently, it is fairness and people and human rights. However, there is one thing that really as well hurt me hearing about when I joined DHS2, which was bugs go to Jira to die. Jira is our bug tracking system. And when I joined, I was like, okay, this is my first mission because I have to do something about that. Why would people even say that? Because, you know, it's, it's great. We collect bugs, we fix them, no? And what I believe is that feedback is essential for good quality, meaning getting it and actually acting on it, not just gathering it somewhere in the box. So what I did was I opened our Jira and let's take a look what's going on there. So in July 12th, this is when I took the screenshot. I could have taken it a bit before. In 2023, I opened Jira and I look at the few main statuses when it comes to bugs. And I see this. So we have 127 bugs that are open. We have uh, 631 in to do. We have 114 in testing and I'm like, oh no. And especially the two statuses here um, make me hurt. <laughs> it is open and testing. Testing is so close to getting there to the users. It's so close to being done. Why did we get stuck there? What happened? And open, 127 bucks. I understand we're an open source project. So every single day we get some bugs created. That's normal. But 127, did we get it created last week? Spoiler alert, no. There were some bugs that have been there for two years and nobody commented on it. And it's just sad because that is feedback waiting for us. And maybe it was a very important bug and maybe it still is, but just nobody knows about it. So we had quite some work to do. 
And looking at all the statuses, this was how July 24th looked like. If you remember the numbers from previously, you may see that actually there are a little bit less bugs in certain statuses because we started cleanup and only then I realized I should take a screenshot uh, of all of them. So 1,113 active status bugs. They are unresolved, which means that that's the backlog of DHS2, just this project and just bugs, right? That's what the teams are working with, mainly three teams, actually. So why do clean air bug backlogs matter overall? Why would we need to do something like that? Well, first of all, when we have a cleaner space, it is less overwhelming and much more manageable, and we can spot issues that should be urgently fixed. Because when we are in a messy room, it's very hard to find that favorite pair of socks because there's so many of them all over the place. And you know, when you're really looking for something, having a lot of things is not helping you at all. And it's hard to find things in chaos. Also, the fixes should reach the users. They should not get stuck in the testing phase, which they have been doing for a while. And it could be that they were missing backwards, for example, or actually maybe it wasn't even fixed and it needs to go back, but then we don't know it it becomes a much faster feedback cycle because we have much less context switching. Imagine you're a developer, you're working on a bug fix and you move it to testing. Someone has to test it and two years later, someone says, oh, actually, there's a problem here. You should move it again and, and fix it. And you're like, what are you talking about? This was two years ago. I forgot about it completely. So if we are slow to provide feedback or act on feedback, we forget things. We do lots of context switching, which does not help us at all. And all this could result in a cleaner environment into more bugs fixed and a better sense of confidence, trust, and quality. We understand what we did it right now, not like what we did two years later. So what we did is we started to revisit, poke, clean up, ask, change, close, open, visualize what we have at dashboards because we wanted to see what's going on there. We have multiple dashboards, which will show just a few. This is one that likely I open every day. Maybe I need push analysis for that, so I could also push the email to more people. Um, so as you can see, we have some of the graphs here and we have different dashboards for this. Having this visibility was actually really nice because then I can just click and go, okay, like what is the open bug that we have? I could also have certain pie charts and split by components, for example, or even by the reporter on who should I poke the most. And there are some in this room, by the way, who I still should poke about some testing bugs. <laughs> but what we did is a few steps. First mission we had was these newly created open status bugs. What happened was we had 127 bugs. That's quite a lot. So what we did is we tried to get out of this chaos to begin with. We had to address those 127 open issues and create, we created some kind of guidelines to help us also manage this when it comes to ongoing process. So first of all, when bug is created, it has status open. What happens then? Well. Uh, we started thinking that we should have some kind of role, like a triaging hat within the QAs. So every week, a person who's like, okay, this week I can take a look, will be looking at those bugs that are coming in. And then they can try to reproduce it, ask the reporter for more information, and actually move it forward. We aim to get back to the reporter within four weeks of bug reporting. That is our rule, and so far, we're still having it <laughs> and we're working on it. But those 127 issues, don't quote us on that. We did not do that, obviously. Um, and if it's missing some information, we ask for it and move it to needs info. So if your bug gets moved to needs info, very rarely it could be that we're moving there because we need information from the team or from design team as well to clarify what's the expectation. But frequently it is because we don't understand exactly what this issue is about. Then, if after four weeks, the reporter does not provide the information, we ask again, and then you have a second chance. So if after four more weeks, the person does not reply, we are going to close the issue. If it is a valid issue, we move it into to-do and raise it accordingly to the team that should prioritize and fix it. 
So I hope this explains a little bit what's going on. But before we had no guidelines. We spoke that we are looking at it every uh, four weeks that the reporter will get the reply. However, that was not the reality. There were bugs there for two years. The process was very ad hoc. Whomever has time, sometimes we take a look there. But now having some kind of clearer idea and this triaging had really helped us. If it's not a new valid issue, we, before closing, explain why we're closing it. I think that's essential. So to provide some context as well and link any related work if it's relevant for this. So then fast forward, it's November 2023 and the biggest historical event happens in my where 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 experience of the HS2 then we finally reach zero open bugs. Did it last long? No. <laughs> this was actually for like maybe one hour and someone else created the, the a new bug. So we understand that it is a moving target and that's normal. We're an open source project, so it's normal that we are going to get incoming bugs. Yet me and Gita were so excited. So if you know, um, if you heard the name Gita and you created some Jira tickets, that's Gita and that's me. Uh, so we are the people who very frequently poke people to ask for more information and provide steps on play. Could you please provide a steps on play? If some of you are cringing about this right now, but <laughs> that's part of our job. We were in Ghana and we were so excited and we showed this dashboard because it showed zero, which you cannot even see here. But it was a, an, a historical event. So then, step two. We had to actually hands-on check the bugs that we had. And there were more than a thousand of them. So that's what we did. And what we found in the backlog were bugs that were almost done and just needed a little push and actually a backport or um, some kind of little change. And that was hard because sometimes you just move it and ask the developer, developer doesn't work there anymore, or the Jira account is not active, or you ask them to backport it and they're like, what is this about overall? What do you want from me? And everyone forgot, nobody knows what's going on. There was some bugs that were not updated for multiple years. We had filters which were not updated for more than six months, and there's a lot of them. We also had issues that were no longer issues, and maybe they were fixed in another ticket. And lots of duplicates, which were very hard to see at first because there's so many of them. So after this, we're like, okay, it's a little bit cleaner, a little bit more manageable, what can we do? So what we did is organized an action to actually fix those bugs. So we organized bugathons. What is a bugathon? Well, it's a dedicated time and effort to fix bugs. Multiple teams did that, and we saw big spikes and actually in fixing and lots of action there. Fast forward almost a year ago, so now you're wondering how did it go? And you saw a little bit of it in Marcus's slides. That's one of the graphs that I like the most. <laughs> and, um, and I'm a graph and numbers nerd. So this one is showing uh, created issues, that's the red line. And then green one is actually issues that are resolved. You see some spikes. This is when teams like most frequently were doing some kind of bugathon. So they were cleaning up, they were looking at their backlog and they're like, okay, this is not relevant anymore. And they were fixing issues then. So I think like that biggest spike is Scott just being like, oh, just close everything. Uh, <laughs> when analytics did their bugathon. And then later on, uh, we had one huge spike with another team. And then later on, I was like, we have to fix more bugs and close more because we have this presentation. So <laughs> that's why we have the, the last spike. And overall, if we're looking at the trend, so this graph below is showing our um, trend of unresolved issues and resolved issues. So basically, the difference between created and resolved so if we're looking at the last year, we have actually cleaned up our backlog substantially. So we're, we have resolved much more issues than we got created. But this fact that we always get issues created, it's very normal. So it always will happen and it will always will take place. So if we remember this screenshot, that was July 12, 2023. Where are we today? Ta-da. So <laughs> we're at... Thank you. We're at zero open status, which uh, 
I had to take a look even today and make sure that it's not, because likely it is not zero right now. Someone created a bug, um, but uh, we're trying to keep it tidy. So even if some days it has like two, three there, or even eight, um, we clean it up much easier than when it was 127. That's a fact. Then we have uh, much less items in testing, which I think was a big thing for us as well, because it's another moving target. We constantly get things to test. And some of those bugs have been there for two years in testing. The challenge there is that it's not straightforward. Sometimes it's very much configuration related. We cannot test it easily. And it takes a week maybe to configure it, or even to find out what that bug was about, because nobody remembers anymore. So we still have some of those long-standing ones that we're trying to clean up, but I think it's it's a very, very nice number. If we look at all the numbers, this was from July 24th, and if you look here, this is the state. So basically, we have 749 unresolved items compared to 1,023, and this is also, you can see that we have less statuses because we had JIRA prog 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 progress process process discussions and we spoke if all the statuses make sense or not i think for the teams also one substantial win and celebration is that we have so much less items in review or in progress because before we also had needs update which was sort of progress that people would forget uh, and now everything combined we have 30 items in progress which still is a little bit much if you ask me but let's leave it as a, as a comment. Um, so we have much cleaner and clearer statuses with smaller numbers, which is much easier to manage. So looking again at numbers, so in the last year, we resolved 1,249 bugs, 904 were created, which means we reduced the backlog by 345 bugs. Do we still have a lot? Yes. Is this nice to look at? Yes, that helps me make sense of all this because sometimes I was going crazy and there were so many bugs to go through and we still have a lot of them, but it's the best feeling when you figure out that one bug fixed four others. Uh, so sometimes it happens that we get a fix for one of them and then the related ones also get fixed and you're like, wow, good feeling to close four of them. This is a continuous mission. We want feedback and we also embrace more ways to get it. And some of the ways to get the feedback that we tried as well were a bug bash. What is a bug bash? So a bug bash is an event where we test together. We invited both internal team and external teams to participate, paired people up and tested together some of the main features in a time boxed event. So we gave two and a half hours and we had pairs of different people. We tried to shuffle them around so they don't know each other. So someone from HISP could pair up with a developer and they could test together. There were 35 participants and we formed 17 teams. The math is not mathing here because some were triples. Um, we actually had 42 bugs discovered. And I believe it was really a rewarding experience, not only to get to know the person you're working with or not working with or learn from them overall, uh, but also to understand the new features, what's coming in, what, what are the main functionalities and have more trust and confidence and also have a say there. We really found some great bugs, especially because from people who were from HISP, for example, because maybe we didn't think that, or the diversity is bringing in such nice perspectives. Someone speaking Arabic can find a very different bug than someone who you know, is usually always using the default English. So I think that's an essential thing for DHS too. The diversity in testing is very important for us and we can find very good bugs, well, not good, good, <laughs> but we can discover them much earlier if we all test together. Oh yeah, and we definitely want to organize more of those and um, in a more frequent basis. So now it was like a big bang, right? So we had a release and we said, okay, let's do it. But uh, we could imagine it being a more regular process where we have a feature ready and we invite everyone, hey, we got this feature ready. If you are interested, join us in to test it. And if you're interested to join, let us know. Uh, and you definitely are welcome.
Then we also had beta testing program, which continued this year as well. Uh, we had seven HISP groups participating in pre-release testing. Uh, so they basically go through the regression testing and execute test cases that are interesting for them. It's a great opportunity to get and provide feedback from a diverse group of our stakeholders. We identified various issues that have been fixed as well before the release. And again, a call for action. If you're interested in participating next time, please let us know. We'd love to strengthen our testing efforts overall and learn more. And now, some secrets. I see some of you are nervous that I will spill some secrets, but those are the rare kind of secrets that you're actually even encouraged to tell. So I really hope you share it overall. First of all, how to get that bug fixed, right? Well, tell us by giving us feedback, participating in events like bug bashes or beta testing program and reporting bugs in Jira. And now the, the secret is up incoming. How do you get that bug fix? A good, clear bug report. I know you don't like this secret. I get it. It's tedious. It's hard to write a good bug report. It's really hard. What does a great bug report have? Well, first of all, a minimal list of steps to reproduce. Preferably on play environment, because we actually want you to produce it in our environments. If we cannot, we would still ask for the list of steps to reproduce. Uh, you could mention the config or what you did. And what I, when I say minimal, I don't mean I did all these 20 steps and then this happened, but can you try to reproduce this in five steps? What if instead of 50 data elements that you're creating, could you do it with one? And sometimes I know it's hard because your use case may be with 50 data elements doing this and this and this, but it can help us greatly to understand it and just simplify the issue. Actual and expected result. What happened and what did you expect? Because sometimes we get it, oh yeah, this, this didn't work, but like, what did you want? What, what should have happened there? Screenshots, videos, one bug, bug per one bug report. I, I got even nervous here because uh, there are some bugs that get uh, sometimes five bugs in one bug. Uh, it's, uh, it's much easier to understand a bug when it's one of them in the report. And also nice to have affected versions. Is it a regression? This helps us to triage. So when we are triaging, we check all the supported versions. That's also quite a tedious work, right? So one bug, we recheck on around five maybe environments to make sure, is it regression or not? Maybe it was fixed in something more recent. Bonus, but I think the bonus is very important here. Context about your usage of the HS2 with a note on the impact this bug has for you. Frequently, we may not understand it because we don't know the use case. We don't know how you're using the HS2. And if you say, hey, this is actually really critical for us because on a daily basis, we're using this feature then it gives us a lot of useful information. This is a nice graphic explaining the art of bug reporting. So if you imagine a bug like a picture, it has a nice title, right? What is it? It's a big bug in a field. Then you can explain the location and environment where the bug dwells. It's a beautiful forest. You can highlight how damaging or dangerous the bug is. Place the bug details in a highly visible area. Describe the bug accurately so others would recognize it. Include the time and date of the bug find and detail how to find the bug again and what footprints to follow. That's a, a, just a, a memory for you to have, but we really appreciate this information. I think especially the how damaging or dangerous the bug is because we should know the bugs if we go to the forest, right? The same with mushrooms and uh, other plants, as well as, and also DHS2 bugs, because we want to know what is the impact of the bug you're facing. And we may not understand it because of the open source nature of DHS2. I created an example bug. So how Lena would create a bug? First of all, title, cannot save a new program rule if it contains doc 2024. Steps to reproduce. One, go to play environment. Uh, maintenance app, program, program rules. Two, click to add a new program rule to child program. 
three, in rule expression add, if the upgrade comment is DAC 2024. Four, define program action, hide field, upgrade score, commit. Five, click save. Um, actual result, 500 error is thrown, the app crashes. See attached screenshot and logs, expected save successfully. Note, the impact is very high because our organization has 500,000 users and all frequently created this program rule in previous DHS2 versions. It's affecting only 2.410. And we have a maintenance app developer here who's not concerned at all because it's not a valid bug. So, but it's just an example. <laughs> when I think about bugs, I think of one of my favorite quotes ever, which says, I wanted to write a shorter letter, but I did not have time. I think about it very frequently because it's very easy to say something in a lot of words, but it's very difficult to say the same essence in less. And I think I wanted to create a better bug report, but I did not have time is something I heard people say to me, but I can say back, well, then you may spend even more your and our time trying to explain it, and it may be at risk of not getting fixed ever. As tedious, as annoying, as frustrating bug reports are, that is our feedback. That is how we understand what's going on. And to simplify it means to simplify the time and effort spent to everyone. For this developer to understand and not assume what it is and to fix it properly as you are facing this bug, it's essential. But to create this good bug report, it takes time. We understand, but let's save it and invest some time in there. We are striving for a continuous quality process. And with all these changes, we may change even more in the future. And that is very normal. Um, and within this year, we had not only this cleanup, which was a hands-on effort, but we also had some more conversations about JIRA process, as well as we had a quality workshop during the dev week we had. This is a picture from this workshop, and we generated lots of content. Quality is such an umbrella term. Quality is almost everything. Quality a lot is our processes. It is a cleaner, less is more environment where we can see what's going on, where we understand and have transparency. So I'd like to finish my talk with this manifesto that fell from this workshop, actually. So what do we try to do in the HS2? Well, we try to help people do their work easier by creating an easy to use and extensible system. We do not add more stress to already stressful environments. We think of each other by providing good documentation and maintainable code, and we continuously improve by reacting to feedback, because feedback is essential. And I really hope that in this talk, you understood why feedback is essential and how to provide better feedback. And we really hope to keep on listening to it and learning from it. Thank you so much. So I think we have some time for questions, right? So if you have any, bring it on. Yes, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm Blake Beer. Um, I just wanted to ask about the current to-do status of Jera. <laughs> that often breaks down into well, my interpretation is I'm hoping that's not the good place that bugs go to die. Right. Um, so what happens when it's there? You know, it's then get approved, which team takes it, that sort of thing. Yeah. So when it comes to the team selection, we have to know it when we move something to, to do. So we have services and we have apps that teams own, and that's how the team gets assigned. The team's fixing it. That's a good mission. And I'm still trying to figure this out, to be honest. We're trying to think through how to do this better because sometimes there could be, I will give like a big spilling of the secret and it's being recorded, but sometimes it seems like the loudest voice wins, which is not fair. And my, again, fairness comes in, like it's not fair. I don't think it's fair that the loudest voice wins. Um, so if you're very persistent in your bug report, it could be that we will check it out, right? But we do try right now, open status, definitely we're checking it out. And if we see something very urgent, we will raise it to the teams immediately. 
especially if it is a regression. So if you see it in 41, but it's not there somewhere else, immediately like just write it down in the ticket, I think it will get attention. However, what you do if it's in all the versions, right? And maybe it's not that important uh, for many, add impact details, which will help us also to raise the importance, I think, if, of your use case. Um, and then we will try to raise it, but then teams should pick it up from to do. So this is the tricky part, right? They should, do they always pick it up? Not always. <laughs> so sometimes they need a little push or a little poke. Uh, during bugathons and bug fixing boxes, we, they definitely look through the backlog and choose what you fix. And we are going to do more of those. So overall, I think the, the vision is quite nice and clear and we will try not to make it that, you know, this another uh, grave. Um, we're still poking it, but uh, definitely the process there is something we're still trying to find out how to move it forward. If there's something important, yeah. I would say message me, but then again, it's a bottleneck. <laughs> yes? Uh, and thank you for the presentation, Dina. Thank you. Oh. Very good. Great. Uh, my name is Anya. I'm from TAU. And my question is I think you've mentioned the transformation, right? The new process, the new way. Yes, the new, the new process, the new way of doing things for Jira tracking. Could you share maybe some like lessons learned, right, that came out of it? Because it sounds like it was something, the new process that touched upon a lot of people on the team mm -hmm. uh, and it changed things for them. So what would you recommend maybe focusing on for those who will be implementing similar transformations yeah. in the future? Thank mm -hmm. you. It's a great question. We actually have a bunch of team in the room, so I'm curious how they felt about the process because some may have been a bit annoyed, you know, with certain things that happened. Um, there were multiple parts in it. So first of all, even the quality conversation when we had it, the whole idea of the workshop was to find out what is quality for us. We never stopped and had to think, I think like many people had ideas, but we were not in one room and thinking what it is. So what we started is we had like a workshop where we just gathered and tried to align on this foundation on where we're standing. What is DHS2 for us? Because for every different role, there's, for example, developer advocates, there's developers, there's QAs, there's PMs. It could be very different things that matter. And I think this workshop allowed us to have the base, right? So the vision and this manifesto is clear, right? So we're all on the same intention when it comes to quality. That's the first thing. Then we had, of course, the ongoing process. And that was sometimes very hard to challenge, to be honest. Um, there were some statuses that still exist because a person vetoed. It's true. <laughs> it's still there, even though people misunderstand it. And sometimes like it's like people ask, why, why is it there? I'm like, ask this person, not me. <laughs> I did not move it there. Um, it happens. But I think uh, what we did, we tried to have team discussions always. So it wasn't that I just came in and said, oh, let's destroy everything. Um, I think it depends on the context. It's very consultant answer. I understand that. But it does. It does depend on your context and your situation. There's no one perfect framework that works for everyone. There's no silver bullet that's going to answer all the life's answers. And the uh, questions. Um, and uh, I think in our case, what we did is mostly workshops, brainstorming, asking opinions. So every team had to provide feedback about Jira process, for example. We asked them, what do you, what do you, how do you use this status? What happens when you move from this status to this status? Who does that actually? Like what does open mean to you? And then we realized that open and needs info are more like triaging statuses for us. And to do is the first status that actually reaches the team. And then from there, we also spoke to the team, like, when do you move to plan? When do you, what does it mean, ready for pickup or not? When you move to development, what happens then? So they had conversations and then all the teams gave back their feedback. And then we made some decisions, like removing needs update status, like it disappeared. We actually do not have it anymore. Um, we had uh, also caution alerts. So where, for example, we said, okay, needs update is being removed next week. So you have some time, you know, to look through your bugs so that people are prepared. But sometimes it also involves individual poking. Um, yeah, I don't know. Some people may be <laughs> upset with me sometimes. But that's a part of my job that I had to do. Uh, because, yeah, we just want to move forward things. And for me personally, I'm like, I just want it to be done, you know? 
I wanted to reach the people and it's hard to grasp it even like, wow, what happened then? You know, it, it reminds me of this philosophical story. I remember once walking in Berlin with my friend and then there was a, a bike, a, a rusty bike a, locked around the tree. And my friend was like, what happened to this person? Imagine one day they're just cycling, they just lock their bike and then they maybe the next day they woke up and they're like, that's it, I'm done, I'm moving to Australia. And they left and the bike is rusty there. I feel like this happens to our bugs very frequently. I don't know what happened to some of them. Like a developer was so excited and worked on it and worked on it. And then the next day and two years later, it's still there. So I feel like there was lots of poking and asking and trying to understand and discussions. So it's not like one clear thing. And the learning was patience, <laughs> which I still need to learn a lot. <laughs> Of, yeah, patience and collaboration, because you cannot just bring in your rule. You have to talk to people about the changes you're making. But we did well, lots of, I think, workshops and discussions, which helped. I don't know, it's, it's a lot that I can tell you about that. So <laughs> we can talk after the talk as well. I hope it gave you a little um, taste of what we went through. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yay. Yes, what, uh, should I see it? We have the participants, so we can hear him. Hello, Lina. Thank you so much for the presentation. You, can you hear me? No. Okay, please. Give us a second. Yes, please. Interesting. Try again. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear? No? Okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to repeat it also. Can you can you start your question? Yes, so thank you for the great presentation and the work. Yeah, I've seen there's a, a real improvement in the last month. So one question, first question is, is possible in Jira to automatically populate uh, like a, a, a template on what do you expect on the these better reports? <laughs> and the uh, second question, is there any kind of uh, like uh, automatic testing to ensure there are no new bugs <laughs> mm -hmm. when, uh, when creating functionalities or when fixing other bugs? Mm -hmm. Like uh, like automatic testing of of, of basic basic things, no? Uh, yeah. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, it was two questions. I'll repeat it because I may forget. Also, uh, the first one is about template for the bugs. Do we have it? And the second one was about automated testing. Uh, very good question. So the first one about template, we were looking into it and we were thinking to add a template for bugs. We haven't found something that would be elegant because it could be a little bit messy. I don't know if you know the Jira automation, sometimes they come afterwards and then you're like, what, I already created a bug and then I get some weird table added in my bug. Um, we're still investigating this. So we were looking at some plugins, maybe to add it. So for now, not yet, but we may introduce this in the future for the automated tests. Yes, so there are all kinds of testing, right? And there's unit tests, there's integration tests, there's end-to-end tests, there's uh, manual tests as well that we do. And we try to improve the coverage, of course, of automated tests. So development teams are doing a lot of testing, actually. Um, and we tried also to remind them of the rule that you fix a bug, add a test. The biggest win, I think, and the most proud moments for me were recently when I looked at some PR and one dev was telling another dev to add a test. And I was like, wow, nice. So we are trying uh, to do that, but there are also, there's also lots of old code. So where tests are unfortunately not being added or it's not that straightforward. So let's say we try to do this, but not always. So there are some areas where maybe like we could improve a little bit more. And um, I think yeah, bugs are always symptoms of something broken in the system. Either it's a missed requirement or we did not add automated checks. And the worst bugs are the ones that keep reappearing. So we definitely need to learn from them and we are trying to improve this and remind people to look at the test code as much as you're looking at the normal code and actually reviewing that and questioning it and asking for tests. I'm saying it out loud so people can do that. <laughs> and your PR reviews. Yes. 
I hope I answered this. Thank you. Hello, my Hi. name is, thank you very much for the presentation, for the nice presentation. My name is Maxi, I come from, I came, I come from uh, MSF Spain, from MOCBA. And uh, you, you explained that uh, the regression testing is done by the different HISP uh, groups, but uh, we are also interested in participating. And you also mentioned that we can, that other people can participate. So you can explain a little bit more, how can we get, how is the process of it? In this. Yeah, so I, I guess you mean beta testing, right? The, that part, right? For bug bashes, if you're on Slack, we usually announce it also in general, so you can get involved. For the beta testing, uh, we are we, we are open to talk to you, and I think I can uh, uh, also in, introduce you to this, uh, this man here in the back, Phil, uh, <laughs> who has uh, way more experience with beta testing, so we're trying to figure out Maybe even a more uh, automated and scalable solution because right now it's quite uh, manual how we onboard uh, teams. So I guess it would be doable, right? Would it to also have not only his? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Phil said that they've been in touch with MSF. This is the for those who couldn't hear. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, we've kept it mostly kind of closed, beta testing with the HISP groups um, so that we can manage it um, so far. But we have had some organizations that we have been in touch with MSF. Um, I think it didn't work due to timing of upgrades this time. We've also um, worked with uh, PEPFAR uh, in the beta testing process before and taken advantage of their many automated tests for their Dayton version of the the system so yeah as lena said we we want to expand beyond uh, these kind of closed groups um so we're looking at how to do that in a way that we can still sort of facilitate the easy feedback um, that can be incorporated in a sort of timely way so hopefully we'll we'll start to do that more and more as we go into the next uh, releases and see if we can improve the process yeah, yeah. Sure. Hello, uh, this is Adrian from ICT. Well, first of all, thank you. I don't know that you were uh, bored, but you noticed that it's changing. This year, so <laughs> this year's nice. And then uh, uh, two quick comments. Uh, one is if you can give some love also to developers, because sometimes we report things that are not in a graphical interface. But if yeah. they are about API, for example, things regarding to plugins for visualization. And we noticed that OCs were a little bit difficult to move them into the to do volume. Mm -hmm. uh, because I understand they are difficult for you to, yeah. to validate and you have like a lot of back and forth, like how can I test this? And it's like this some JavaScript code. <laughs> it's gonna be painful. So yeah, it's, it's, I, I know that this is particularly difficult. Um then uh the other comment is like uh, when you close an issue, that I know that sometimes the issues are related to the pull request, and there is a one-to-one -one mapping that is clear, but sometimes there is not. And if you can not only close the issue, but let us know what happened. Mm -hmm. And I have a good example because we reported an issue with French translation in data visualization and dashboard, and actually Caroline closed it, and they're like, it's done. Mm -hmm. and, and no, but it's a good example because uh, the it's kind of he, uh, she wrote a, a link to a translation platform, I guess. I couldn't access, but I understand that it was a translation platform that needs to move the translation to the code. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for that bug fix, and it was like, it's fixed, it's not fixed. I was like, it's telling the new version of the data visualizer. And then I realized that it was broken, kind of broken the link between the platform and the code. So it was a good way for me to say, like, can you reopen the issue? Because I think that you have a problem with this connection. So. <laughs> Just saying, yeah. that you can also like tell us how you solve it, mm -hmm. and it's really useful. And then my last comment, um, <laughs> and done, I promise, is like uh, sometimes you are deprecating some apps into new apps, and this is a little bit tricky because, for example, we have this with event report and like listing old tracker API, new tracker API, and it's typical to say like we are not maintaining this anymore. You need to go to the new one, but the new one has. 
this feature is not in the new one. And then we are in the middle of nowhere because you are not fixing the old one, but the new one is there. And also this has changed. I, I understand, for example, we have a bug in event report that you have accepted and it's planned to be fixed because it's not in line listing. But again, it's, you can put a little bit of love in that sentence, like, you know, it's in the new app, but sometimes it's not there. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is all. No worries. I fully understand it. And yeah, I'm trying to put lots of love everywhere. <laughs> but I think we all have to. We all have to. And uh, even though in the manifesto, we have, uh, oh, I cannot move back, but we have, uh, we make good documentation. I think we still need to grow there. We're trying and we're trying to also in each comment also to add, you know, the context, right? Why are we closing? What's happening? What is the other work that's related? Uh, we're, we have improved, I think, quite a bit, but there's still room for improvement. And yeah, maybe call us out when we, when we you know, don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a very good example. Yeah, so so uh, definitely, yeah, don't let us just, you know, be like, ah, oh, whatever. Um, the, the microphone is here. But you wanted to comment a bit on this, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, documentation for sure. And we're also trying to encourage in Jira, but also the PRs are open. So you should see them if they're linked, right? And the solution itself. So we likely won't be explaining like how we solved it or was the problem. It will be in the PR. But yeah, if it's not linked as well, like that's all on us, right? To try to link them, I think, and to explain what happened. But yeah, definitely the context giving the documentation, it is something that we're trying, we're trying. Hopefully we get better. Hello. Hey. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Cristian Atavillos. I am from an American Excel organization. Um, I have a question. Uh, sorry if you uh, answered it before, but uh, how is the process to reproduce the ABA that was reported that was reported in Capture, for example. Yeah. Um, this is a manual, or this is an automat automat automatized process. Mm -hmm. It is true. Uh, which are which tools are involved in in, in this process? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because first of all, it's humans that report the bugs. Which means if your bug is not clear steps, you, and no one quick can automate it. Sometimes we, we get like, I don't know, five paragraphs in one bug. And then you're like, okay, what, which one is the issue? Sometimes it's multiple bugs in one. If it was one structure, then maybe we could automate. But right now we read every single report. And sometimes I read something, I'm like, I have no idea, Carolina, maybe you know. And then I, I try to ask the, ask a friend, you know, to help me. And I'm like, can you triage this? And I'm like, Marcus, do you know about this? And Marcus, oh, I don't know either. And then we try to find someone who may know. So. The short answer would be, if you can write a clear bug report, just clear steps, what does it do? What, how does it impact you? It would help us enormously because we're trying to understand each other. Humans are very hard to understand sometimes because we speak different languages. We may phrase things differently. It's very hard to write short letters and clear bug reports, right? So that means that sometimes when you know, it's like, it's very clear for you. It could be completely not clear for someone else. So we've had many cases when I open a bug, I'm like, I have no idea what it is. So even this triaging process has been super helpful for us because then I'm like, could you please provide us the steps on page to reduce? Sometimes we have to write example, like one, two, three, four, you know, so that we understand what's happening. Sometimes we ask about configuration. We ask about the import files, right? Like what file actually are you importing there? Can you give us an example from play? Can you make smaller steps? So it is very manual process. Once we understand the steps, we reproduce it on all the environments, which could be sometimes like there were, there have been bugs about import of data where I remember I had to create new instances, like five of them, and then like maybe five more so can I can compare how it is between those two on all the versions. So it's very tedious actually to, to do it. And depending on the bugs, some are like, that's why some move much faster. Because they're very straightforward, right? If I just check a button and I don't need to do anything, it's one thing. But if I need to run analytics each time I'm verifying something, it will take me time. And if it's five instances I need to test on, and then if it's also unclear, or then some weird error throws up in the middle of after two days of you testing it, which happens. Like, oh, no, not this again. This happens all the time. So it's very manual, and we also try to also polish it and make the steps a little bit more beautiful so that we understand it better, we have less assumptions, we move forward. Yeah, that would be the answer.
Any other questions? Yeah. First one's a bit, just to clarify now with the V41, the active yeah. supported versions. Yes. And the second one, what about bugs which are in contradiction with other people's bugs? Mm -hmm. So an example of this, uh, we had an issue for not being able to enter event dates in the future. Mm -hmm. um, that got incorporated. Someone else didn't like that. So they raised a bug to say, don't allow future event dates. That got done. And we had to come back and be like, no, please allow it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a bit of back and forth. So does that, how does, how does that get caught? Yeah. Oh, uh, first of all, the versions, right? Uh, right now, but yeah, Marcus will be able to answer me. Or you were, oh no, you were not. I thought you wanted to say something. Okay. I was like, okay, oh. let him answer the hard question. Um, yeah. So about the versions, 38 is the last one and should have the last build very soon. So after that is 39 up. Yeah. Thank you for an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, there was one thing that didn't pick up too much, and that's like, what is a bug? Right. And um, uh, in the absence of very clear specifications, uh, we are allowing a, a Maybe a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, interpretation room and leeway than than we like, honestly. Uh, so I, I've been in projects where you would get your bug rejected if you didn't send a link to the documentation that proved that it was a bug, you know. <laughs> and and we are not like that at all because we don't have that documentation. It's not good enough. So then sometimes. Uh, that very thing that you mentioned might happen um, and it might not get caught and if it does get caught it would be uh, yeah it, it would be because we, we try to raise the question when there looks like there should be a doubt or when there seems there could be a contradiction but yeah it, uh, there are mul multiple aspects there right so one when we fix a bug we should not only add the test we should also update documentation which sometimes maybe, you know, we let it slide, which means then it's not documented, right, that it should work this way. And then someone else could say, oh, actually, it should work differently. And then we change it. But if we had documentation, we could say, no, actually, this is not a bug because we agreed this. But because we don't have it, sometimes we may fall and show this. In that case, it would be the team's decision, right? Or we, we would hope that VMs have good memory, which, you know, I have terrible memory, so I forget everything, but maybe they do, and then they could say, okay, this I remember, this was, you know, the request, and we should, this is not a bug. There are many cases when I wonder, is it a bug or a feature? Then I would ask the team or someone who may know more about this feature, and is, is this actually working as expected or not? Because it could be that we're closing it because it's not a bug. It could be we're changing type to a feature because you're basically requesting a feature as well. Um, so many cases like that. And those about those technical bugs, right, that you report, I don't believe something is too technical. Like, uh, let's think behind the UI, but we can write the clear steps with whatever setup it is. Like, we can try to, like, find it out, and we can try to reproduce. But sometimes it's also like, this is 200, but should have been 204. And I'm like, but where was it written that it should be 204, you know? And then, you know, we may clarify with the teams. But, uh, yeah, some bugs are more complicated than others to understand, but I don't think that they're less worthy somehow. Wow, it's a, such a motivational talk about bugs and their worth. <laughs> yes, Phil and Marcus. Thank you. Um, since we have a bit of time, yes, I wanted to respond on this uh, 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 translation issue because I think I recognize oh. the issue, yeah. and I think it it highlights a couple of uh, sort of interesting things. Um, to share so one is that we have like a process for translation which actually slows down the process if if that's where the bugs are um because it can be in the translations themselves on the platform where it could be in the code so to to sort of go around the loop the process slows down so in this particular case um 
we we looked on the translation platform and we saw some problems. And actually, we fixed this. This was a kind of systemic problem. And we fixed a kind of a lot of uh, translation issues by looking at this. And we thought that was it. But then we had to wait for the cycle. And, uh, you know, we're human. It got dropped. It sort of fell through the cracks. And this is where we need you guys to be persistent, you know, because it will happen from time to time. And that was a really... That's a really important thing that you guys keep pushing on on these when occasionally this this happens and so in this case it sort of takes a while and it went through the cycle again we eventually found the real issue which was still a translation problem but partly due to the code not having the map so i think it's a good example of like our slightly imperfect systems some of the challenges of the way the the system is built causes you know difficulties in not just fixing but finding the root cause and all of these factors together so we just really why we have to work together um with this sort of feedback loop as as lena's been pushing i absolutely agree i mean the the, the thing is that the limit be the boundary between being persistent and being a pain in the ass is particularly <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to go back to these guys to tell them, please look into my issues. It's like, I'm pretty bad. Welcome to my life. That's <laughs> daily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was a good example. And, and actually, I didn't know about that, but I know what the code is. And I was like, something is not connected here. And I could send you some links. But yeah, I, I think this is the right approach. Yeah. And please help me in being persistent because sometimes I also like, oh, again, I need to poke this like 10 times. And if someone else writes, I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm not alone. <laughs> so it's great that you ask and keep us accountable as well. And now that I have the microphone and I'm talking to you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, if you can keep being transparent, uh, it's super useful for the rest. And I'm talking now about criticism. And this is why I'm looking to you. Like, for example, to have an approx timeline of the next release. I know that it has two sides. One is that if you don't go with that deadline, everybody's going to tell you, you tell me that by mid-June the release is going to be out. But if you can put like a approx time and I don't know, an asterisk saying disclaimer, this is maybe not happening or something like that. This is one example of where transparency is really good for us. <laughs> okay i think you mean uh patch releases yeah. right yeah yeah i think you know you're not the only person asking this a lot of people have been pushing uh for this and it's true we're a bit reluctant to to give too fixed a time uh but i definitely we see the need to to give more of a timeline we know that you all have to plan things based on uh patch releases as as much as anything We've tried to make things a bit better with the continuous app delivery. It's, it uh, kind of removes some of the need uh, for, for this, but we know that still you need to plan uh, around the core up updates. So uh, yeah, it's something I think you'll see hopefully soon. We've discussed it uh, also internally um, with our teams needing a bit more visibility. Um, so we have, a, we have a rule of thumb that we use for working out the next releases but yeah to put it on a timeline that you guys can see as a rough guide uh i think you'll see that coming soon we just want to find the best way of presenting it basically and making it uh, available yep thank you any more questions don't see anything online well if not um Talk to me, write to me. I'll try to at least validate your pain <laughs> and vouch for it um, and see what I can do to help you out also and persist on other teams also and poke the issues around. Yeah, let, let's keep in touch. Um, I'll stay here um, until tomorrow only. But if you're online, also feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Keep on persisting. Keep on reporting those bugs. Do not be afraid. We're waiting. We're ready for you. We have zero open bugs. Thank you.